somebody said after saying, well, our political views aren't homogenous, we don't like being treated as if they were, and these activists don't speak for us, they say, look, most of us would just like to be a little bit more invisible if we could, and all this terrible concentration on preferred pronouns and, and identification of transsexual people has made our lives a living hell. Well, and no so, wonder, because it's hard. You imagine, you're, imagine that you are having real trouble with your gender identity, you know, and you're a six foot one guy and you want to transform yourself into a woman. It's going to be hard enough for you to be, you know, quasi invisible in a socially acceptable way without a bunch of people who purport to be speaking on your behalf, making this like issue du jour for their political reasons. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the letter writers have been telling me. Mm -hmm. So, so no, I, I don't, I don't see that. I mean, the, the legislation is, was incoherent as originally formulated, then it was made worse by its shopping before activist groups. There's no evidence whatsoever that it will have the outcomes that the, that the people who formulated it hypothetically desire, because I don't believe that they desire the best possible outcome anyways. The people, look, the people who are formulating these sorts of policies state quite forthrightly. So for example, if you go look at women's studies websites, they state quite forthrightly that their aim is the destruction of the patriarchy, whatever the hell that is. You know, I mean, and that, that, that's a good indication of the level of intellectual sophistication that goes into this sort of thinking. What is this patriarchy? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, what is it exactly? I mean, if we're going to talk about it, it it's, it's male domination of everything and nothing but oppression. It's like, really, that's how we're going to define our society, is it? Compared to what society exactly? Where have people been more free than they are, for example, in this country? That doesn't mean they're perfectly free, but, you know, forget that. That's never going to happen. It's like, well, this is an oppressive place compared to my hypo the hypothetical utopia that I would produce if I happened to be, you know, uh, Stalin for a week. And I, as, I've, as, I've, as, I've, as I've already pointed out, if you were the, the hypothetical um, altruistic utopian of your imagination, then the people right behind you in your bloody revolution would stab you to death in your bed and you wouldn't get to make your, your decisions for the benefit of anyone every, anyways. So, so how do you think progress should be made in a world where we are freer than we've ever been? Do you think we, like when are there changes that are desirable to be made and how would you want to see them implemented if not through policy or through activism the way that certain groups currently are promoting. Well, back, you know, this happened in the 60s, as far as I can mm. tell, that we got this misbegotten idea that the way to conduct yourself as a, as a responsible human being was to hold placards up to protest, to change the viewpoints of other people and thereby usher in the utopia. It's like, I think, I think that's all appalling. I think it's appalling and, and I think it's absolutely, it's, it's absolutely absurd that students are taught that that's the way to conduct mm. themselves in the world. First of all, if you're 19 or 20 or 21, you don't bloody well know anything. You haven't done anything. <laughs> you don't know anything about history. You haven't read anything. You haven't supported yourself for any length of time. You've been entirely dependent on your state and on your family for the, for the brief few years of your existence. And the idea that you have enough wisdom to determine how society should be reconstructed when you're sitting in the absolute lap of luxury protected by, by, by processes that you don't understand is absolutely, I mean, it's, Okay, so that's a bad, let's call that a bad idea, sure. shall we? <laughs> and, then we? And then the idea that what you should do to change the world is to find people who you disagree with and shake paper on sticks at them and call them names is also, and, and it's a, it, and that you, you do that before you go out for, here, I'll, I'll tell you how serious the activists are. This is something that's just unbelievably comical as far as I'm concerned. So some of you may know that um, I participated in a debate on free speech, so-called debate at free speech that the University of Toronto hosted. Um, it turned into a forum and, and, and whatever that is, but it's certainly not a debate. But one of the things I did when I was talking to the university administration was to suggest how they might deal with the possibility of protesters. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, that's easy. I know how you can have absolutely zero protesters. Um, have it in the morning, they won't get out of bed. <laughs> Mm. So we had it at 9 o'clock in the morning, and there was one MP, a member of parliament, who showed up to hand out some pamphlets, not a single protest. So it's like, if you want a controversial speaker on campus, just have it at 7 in the morning. You won't get a protester within 50 yards of it, because they'll still be sleeping off last night's hot and alcohol-induced hangover. <laughs> So 
so, so, you know, and the question was, what uh -huh. do I think people should do? And yeah. I'll, I'll tell you something that's been very interesting to me, and I can see it reflected here. The first thing I've noticed is that um, when I started putting my videos on YouTube, which was about three years ago, I noticed that about 85% of the people that were watching them were men. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's pretty weird, because about 80% of my students are women, you know, mm -hmm. because men are bailing out of universities like mad, and there won't be one in the social sciences and humanities left in 10 years, but, you know, nobody seems particularly worried about that. You can go look that up online if you want, and look at the enrollment curves and just project them 10 years out into the future. And I've been following that for about 20 years. But one of the things, but online, it was so it was 85% men. I thought, wow, that's really weird and strange. And then I made these political videos, and then it popped up to 91% men. And then I've noticed in the audiences that I've gone to talk to that it's almost all men. Now just look around here. Man. It's like, what, it's got to be 90% guys in the audience. What the hell is going on? It's weird. And I noticed that at the first free speech debate at the University of Toronto. I made a point of it. I walked into the room and I thought, wow, these are all men. So I had the men stand up and the women stand up. And I used that as an example of the fact that maybe men and women have different interests. And it's, you know, just an ad hoc demonstration. But it's really been borne out by the demographic analysis of my viewers. And I have, you know, several, not eight million views or something like that now. So it's a pretty big population. I've been talking nonstop about personal responsibility and about the fact that if you want to change the world, you should bloody well get your act together and quit whining and sniveling about how horrible everything is and about how people owe you more rights and more privileges. And for some reason, that seems to be a message that's really resonating among young men. And I think the reason for that, first of all, I think young women have enough to do. And so that's perhaps part of the reason why the message isn't as necessary for them. They're trying to juggle career. They're trying to figure out how to have a family. And they don't really have any question about whether or not that's useful and proper. So they're off doing that and, and whatever else they're doing. But young men seem to have more of a choice about that, and many of them are essentially bailing out. And it's partly because I think they've been well punished for their virtues. And so I talk to young guys in particular about, you know, adopting some responsibility and mm -hmm. trying to straighten out their lives and to bear the load of being properly and to forthrightly move through existence and to become a credit to themselves and their community. And that's what you should do instead of waving cards at someone telling them to behave more properly because you're morally superior to them. So, and for some reason, that message, which is, it's a really, it's not the sort of message that you would expect to sell, right? It's the, exactly the opposite of something that you would consider saleable. But my experience has been that the young men in particular are so bloody desperate for that message that they can hardly stand themselves. And, and it's no wonder, because it's a call to, it's a call to proper being. It's a call to heroic being. And it's a call for people to adopt their individual responsibility and to straighten themselves out and to find out what they could be like if they took on the burdens of existence like, like respectable, well-educated, articulate, powerful people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's to the benefit of everyone. Yeah. And so, well, so that's where the responsibility lies. And I'm not interested in, look, I've thought for many, many years, decades really, about having a political career. I mean, I was interested in a political career when I was 13. And so every five years or so, I've probably revisited that. But every time I revisited, I came to the same conclusion, which was that the, the work that I was doing that was focused on a philosophy of individual responsibility and trying to identify how that philosophy had emerged in the West over thousands of years was more important than any possible political action could be. And I still don't regard what I'm doing as political in any sense of the word. I think it's, I think it's philosophical most accurately and there's an element of it that's theological. So, so, so I think it's individual responsibility. And the meaning of life is to be found in the adoption of individual responsibility. And that's what the university should be teaching people. So, Dr. Peterson, you mentioned these ideas of responsibility, of virtue, of respect. You've, I think, detailed what you think students shouldn't do in these examples of like protests and these examples of certain types of activist tactics. What advice would you have for students? How can students make the changes that they want to make? Particularly, do you have any advice for students here? Yeah, read great books. Mm -hmm. Really, man. You've got this four-year period that, that has been carved out of your lives by society. They, they, it's, it's given you an identity, like a high-quality identity, and freedom at the same time. And you're not going to get that again in your life. You've got a, you've got a respectable identity, university student, and complete freedom associated with that, or as near as you're ever going to get. And you've got these unbelievable libraries that are full of the writings of people mm -hmm. who, are, who are intelligent and articulate beyond comprehension. And, you know, 
and, and you can go there and you can learn all this. And you might think, well, why should you learn it? Um, well, you, you learn it to get a job, or you learn it to get good grades, or you learn it to get a degree, and that's all nonsense. It's nonsense. The reason that you come to university to be educated is because there's nothing more powerful than someone who is articulate and who can think and speak. It's power, and I mean power of the best sort. It's authority and influence and respectability and competence. And so you come to university to craft your highest skill, and your highest skill is to be found in articulated speech. And if you're, if you're, if you're a master at formulating your arguments, you win everything. And better than that, when you win everything, everyone around you wins too. Because to transform yourself into, let's consider, consider your transformation into something approximating the logos. It means you shine a light on the whole world. Well, there's nothing more exciting to do than that. There's nothing better you can possibly do. And to think that you're coming to university to be, you know, trained to have a job, it's like, great, that's a hell of a lot better than being unemployed and covered with Cheeto dust while you're snacking away in front of your video game in the basement. But it's not, it's not a, and I don't have anything against video games, by the way. But, it, 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 but it's hardly a triumphant call to, to being in the world. And that's what university should be calling forth. It's like, God, you people, you, as, you know, I, I know what Harvard students are like. I taught here for five years. You people are spectacular. You're spectacular. You're